So this talk is on the imitation of Christ and being desirous of God. So that would be the title if we wanted to give it a title. And it, it has to do with, um, obviously, you know, imitation of our Lord. But the imitation of our Lord is really supposed to be the center of our whole spirituality. So this is kind of a reminder in some capacity on what that might look like. Because in, in reality, we just don't live that way. In all honesty, we just don't do that. So, but before, first, before I get into that, why this is, this is, this is more necessary than just looking at the fact of our simple spiritual life and getting to heaven. But I want to look at it more along the lines of our current condition in society right now. Everything's falling apart. I mean, you can try to be as positive as you want to. It's only going to get worse. And that, that's just the way it goes. I mean, don't, don't, don't be too heartbroken over the whole thing. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse. If we get Trump for four more years, great. Uh, but that's going to end. And eventually, it's going to go democratic, which is socialist. And we're going to be socialist. And it's probably going to get worse than that. <clears throat> They've already talked very openly what they're going to do with the Catholic Church and people that believe in God. Uh, don't think things are going to get better. They're not. They're just going to get worse. They're going to keep getting worse. And you have to look at what we're dealing with right now, even in the church. It, it, we're just being chastised. We haven't been faithful. So what is our response? What are we supposed to do? And it's not to get discouraged about it. It's just to look look the, 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 the storm in the eye and, and realize we're, get, we're being hit by something. And how do you get through it? You, you just put your head down and you break right through the thing. And if the storm lasts our entire life, it doesn't matter. You're going to die. And it only matters what happens after you're dead. Do you go to heaven or do you go to hell? It's, a, it's just a simple thing. Our life really is that simple. However, we wake up day to day and we get confused and we get involved in all the things that are going on and, and one thing leads to another. Next thing you know, we're not thinking about what we ought to be doing. That's trying to get to heaven. Instead, we just get all confused and we're all guilty of it. Uh, and we start piddling in little things and talking about little things and worrying about little things. The next thing you know, we just got to go to confession again. But what's the need for? What I think the, 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 way, the way I want to approach this right now is is that the culture is completely falling apart. It's only going to continue to completely fall apart. So who's going to rebuild it? It's only going to be those who have the truth. At the time of the Roman, there's very many similarities. At the time of the Roman Empire, at the end of the Roman Empire, uh, everything started to fall apart. I think I mentioned this last night. I mentioned it a lot because it's what we're dealing with right now. The culture started to fall apart. Uh, men started to do things with other men that they're not supposed to do. And women started to do things with women they're not supposed to do. People started to eat all the time, and in their, they had these little vomitoriums where they would just go vomit and keep eating more food. You couldn't find men to fight in the army anymore or in the military because they were busy going to the vomitoriums and doing things with men that they shouldn't be doing with men. This was what the culture was. They had to pay somebody to fight for them, which led to a bunch of people that could care less about fighting for their with for the Roman Empire. And so people started to break over the, the, the boundaries into the Roman Empire. And little by little, everything just fell. A couple other things that were very interesting. Women became the matriarchs, meaning they started to lead their families. And dogs started to replace children. See any similarities of today? Any similarities? So when we start to replace order for disorder, and disorder becomes uh, the, the mainstay of our daily interactions with our society, it, it can only last so long until it teeters and falls. Well, once that fell in the Roman Empire, which Gregory the Great um, and others believed the world was coming to an end, they believe the world was coming to an end. That's how bad it was. And many people today, I mean, you constantly get these prophecies, the world's coming to an end. Well, we're always saying that, and it never comes to an end. 
So you don't have to worry about the world coming to an end. You can think about the three days of darkness, but don't worry about the three days of darkness. That would be fantastic to know that something's happening. Right now, the chastisement's so bad, nothing's happening, and everyone's just going to hell. Right? What's worse? Three days of darkness, look outside, you could die. whoop do you do If you're in a state of grace, you die and you go to heaven, right? Or at least purgatory. In the state we're in right now, you keep moving forward as though everything's just fine and you just aren't saved afterwards. You just go to hell. That's a horrible chastisement. Fire from heaven would not be that bad because you could repent right there. The great majority right now are just going to be damned. Well, as the, as the culture continues to just disintegrate and fall apart, and as it did at the time of the Roman Empire, then everything went to a feudal system, right? You had the feudal system that came to be. Well, we probably wouldn't do a feudal system now. We'd probably have something like a tribalism, wouldn't we? We already have something like that. Everyone would go to their little group. You already see it in social media. Everybody kind of has their own pocket. I really don't know how social media stuff works, but everybody kind of has their own little things and whatever else. So you could see today, if everything were just to fall apart, you need community. So people are going to start banding together people that are like-minded and think a particular way, right? Well, who's going to win in the end? What, what community is going to be able to rebuild? You saw what happened with the, uh, with, with the group that took over, what's it called? Um, uh, Portland, uh, Seattle, in, in Seattle. The chop, yeah. I saw a guy that, a guy that got in there and did an investigative reporting and he just went around talking to everybody and he talked to one of the ladies who was like, uh, she's one of the leaders or whatever. She had absolutely nothing to say except for you've got to let everybody out of jail. You've got to get rid of the police. You've got to, you've got to, you know, completely destroy the judicial system. You've got to burn down all the buildings. There was no building. There was only destroy everything. And then the guy said, and then? She's like, and then? I don't know. I don't know what to do then. She had the brilliant idea of just destroy everything. And then? I don't know. <laughs> so, so if you don't have the truth, if you don't have the truth, you don't know what to do. You just know how to break things, burn things down, destroy stuff, turn things upside down. But you don't know how to build anything. You don't know how to create anything. You don't know what to do. You're just a destroyer. But those who have the truth will be able to rebuild because we have a culture. The Catholic Church gives us a culture. We have a society. We have laws. We understand because God, God created all things. We know God. We've been, that it's been revealed to us and we're able to build back on that firm foundation, right? So in that same system, you'll have Catholics that'll band together. But those Catholics, Nowadays, you get a lot of people who want to flee the world and they want to go live on a plot of land and not have any interaction with the world. And I'm against it. I really think that Catholics, as everything starts to disintegrate and fall apart, they're being called to do something very special. And that's bring Christ to the world. As it falls apart, as the whole culture disintegrates, you need somebody who can show you the, the way back. You need to you, you need to you need to find somebody who has that element of truth and knows how to build. You also need people who are willing to suffer and die. Right. So the way we start this and the way we get to this, we have to be able to show that we are members of that true culture. That is, we're imitators of Christ and not just that we're imitators of Christ. We have to show that it's Christ um, that, that it's Christ that we bring back to the world. I, let me try to make it more clear. We don't just go out into the world and tell everybody we're Catholic. We don't just go out into the world and wear a cross and everybody knows we're Catholic. We don't just go. They have to be able to see it. They have to be able to touch it. They have to be able to say, why is this one different? I like, I like what they're doing. They're going to see them putting us to death. And people are going to be inspired by that. But what Catholics willing to die today? Nobody. They're not willing to die. They're not even willing to put their phones down. I mean, think about it. If you're not willing to stop using that stinking phone 
all the time make excuses for using it. Why are you going to die for the faith? You're not. You're just not going to do it. You're going to make an excuse and you're going to say that there's some reason why you have to be here and take care of your family and all these other things. No, you don't. You need to do you need to witness to the faith right now is what you have to do. And they're going to see that. They see you witnessing to the faith right now. Why was he able to do that and I'm not? Why did he stand up for something and believe something was true? But the way we have to be able to do that is there has to be something very palpable about us that they see is different than this wretched existence. It's different from these people who want to destroy and burn and, and, and just turn everything upside down. They have to see order and they have to find love. Right? So the, what I want to reflect on today is the imitation of Christ and exactly what that means. Not exactly what it means. And I'm not talking about the book, you know, Imitation of Christ. It's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing to have if you don't have the Imitation of Christ, which I would presume most of you, if not all of you have, to have a copy of the Imitation of Christ. That's something you could use daily for the rest of your life for meditation every day. Just to read little bits and reflect on what that is. So let's go through and we just want to think about from our daily lives. We want to think about Christ and how Christ, uh, how how we can imitate, how we can how we can perpetuate and instill in ourselves these virtues of Christ. OK, so I'm just going to go through and we're going to read a couple of things and we're going to reflect on a couple of things. So in the imitation of Christ. When we reflect and we think about how humble that he was among men, you have the God man, you have God incarnate in the flesh of a man who lowers himself to a state that he we probably don't think about this much. He took on a lower state that is a. Um, um, like economic state or a social status. He took a lower social status than all of his disciples. He had a lower social status than all of his disciples. Think about it. They were businessmen. You know, he was, he was from a poor family from Nazareth, Nazareth. His, his father was a, was a carpenter. It was probably a good carpenter, but he was a failure in the business sense. Why? Because St. Joseph didn't charge anybody anything. He, he lived on, he, he did things for justice sake. He did a good job and expected them to pay him on justice sake. Well, most people won't pay you just on justice sake. If you don't have a deal and you don't, they're going to undercut you all the time. So that, that caused St. Joseph to be a mediocre, quote unquote, carpenter in the sense that they, they probably just were poorer than most people because they relied on providence. That was the faith of St. Joseph. So we're not talking about his work ethic. We're not talking about his capability. We're talking about other people's ability to pay him what, what the work was worth. And he, he didn't argue over that. He didn't try to take anybody to court over that. If they just didn't pay him, what would he do? He just wouldn't do anything about it. He trusted God. So our Lord came from a very low rank in society. He was born in a barn. That's what you want to call it. It's just this little cut out in the side of the hill where, where shepherds who were considered like the worst of the worst would go in rainstorms and where they would have their children. The shepherds were despised. They, they weren't people you wanted to be around. They were ruffians is what we might call them today, right? In, uh, in the moral theology, they call them rudies. Rudies, these ruffians. People with very low you know, understanding of things, whatever. But the Jews didn't have... A, the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't have a high esteem for shepherds, right? Well, they were the first people that our Lord announced everything to. He associated himself with them in a stable, uh, in this little cutout, this little cave, and was born like many of them were born. Very interesting. Low social status, but very humble. So amongst even his simple disciples, he took the lowest place. 
How often are we willing to take the lowest place? We're not. It, it, dry, it infuriates us when someone, when someone relegates us to the lowest place. It infuriates us. We can't stop thinking about who are they? Who are they to put me down like that? Who are they to relegate me to this lower spot? You know, what do they think of me? It drives us crazy. You know how it is at work when your boss talks down to you or you, you have a neighbor that talks down to you or however it goes. It's our pride. It rages in us. Our Lord was humble among men. How kind he was to his disciples. You know, that's not the easiest thing to do. They're traveling. They were in hot environments. They're always asking silly questions. They're arguing. He just tells them he's going to die. He's going to suffer and die. And then they're all bickering about who's going to be who's going to be the, the, the like second in charge and get some rain. And he's just like, what are you all talking about? But he was very patient. He was very kind with them. He had four or five, six, seven thousand people following him around the desert. and They didn't even have anything to eat. Then he meets them the next day and they're all just like, work a miracle for us. What's the proof? They just want to eat again. And, you know, he just he humbly thinks about what to say to them and and, and you know, helps them to reflect on something more. Uh, you know, our, our Lord was very he was very kind to his disciples and didn't have bitter words for them. He didn't snap at them when he was tired. Our Lord was tired. He sat down at the well at midday. He was hungry and he was tired and it was hot outside. But he didn't snap at anybody. Why were you talking to her? They said when he was talking to the woman at the well. Well, what, what, what business is that of yours? What are you talking? He didn't say anything like that. How compassionate towards the poor to whom he likened himself in all things. Remember, there's people crying out. They wanted to speak to our Lord and they're rebuking these people. But our Lord had compassion, said, bring them to me. Would we be like our, the disciples or would we be like our Lord? We always want to think we would be like our Lord. We always do. But how are we? That's, that's the question. How are we in our daily lives? How are we when we're tired? How are we when somebody cuts us off? How are we when they speak badly about us? How are we when the waitress doesn't bring us the third or fourth or fifth Coke? You know, you know how people get. You start, you start murmuring about it like, like, like you've just been completely uh, slanted by somebody. They need to, they really need to respect your authority. You're the one eating here. They need to refill your Coke. <laughs> How he slighted no one. How he did not flatter the rich. We're quick to flatter people that can help us. Or we're quick to flatter people who have some kind of authority over us. Or people that we're pleased with or can offer us something. But people that can offer us nothing... You ever stop and talk, I know some of you probably do, but you ever stop and talk to these simpletons that are homeless and stuff in the cities? You know? It, it is a, our Lord would have treated them with the same dignity as if he would have treated somebody of a, of a greater, higher standing, right? He wouldn't have seen a great difference there because he saw a person that he created in his image and likeness in some capacity. How free he was from the cares of the world, not anxiously intent, not anxiously intent upon the necessities of life. He just walked into a town. He didn't have anywhere to stay and nobody offered him any place to stay. Somebody came and said, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. And he just calmly says, I didn't have anywhere to sleep. I don't have anywhere to sleep. I mean, foxes have den, the, 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 the birds of the air have their nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't complaining. I wasn't complaining about it. Have you ever gone somewhere and expected some help and nobody would help you? Probably not. Because you've all lived in a certain way where you can take care of yourselves. And you expect to be able to take care of yourselves. And you won't go somewhere where you have to expect God's providence. Have you ever really tried to live by God's providence? Have you really ever tried to trust God? Because if you have, you will know He really will take care of you. It just won't be how you want it sometimes. Consider how patient he was when he was offended. Now you got to remember, every time he sat down to start talking to the people, 
when they mention those Pharisees and the scribes being there, it's not because they liked what he was saying. They were traitorous wretches that were there only to trip him up and condemn him. That's what they were there for. Now you think, you go somewhere, you go, I don't know, let's say you go after Mass over for donuts or coffee, right? And there's somebody that always comes over when you're talking to a small group of people, always comes over, and you know they come over because they hate you. And they're waiting for you to say something so they can go tell everybody what you said to trip you up and get more people to hate you. How are you going to act? You are not going to give them, a, you're going to give them a nasty look. You might snap at them in some way. You know how it is. But how did our Lord do it? No, he just kept talking so, so calmly and so confidently about things. And when they stopped and asked him a question, he'd be honest. You, he didn't call them brood of vipers. That was St. John the Baptist. But he would have, he would have very, he would have sharp, quick things to say. They were not disrespectful, but were pointed they were pointed and to show them the state of their soul. But he would answer them, wouldn't he? You look through Scripture, he answered them. And then he'd ask, he, and there was one guy trying to trip him up, and the guy answers correctly, and our Lord says, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. That's very gentle. The guy probably wasn't there for the right reason, and our Lord saw that you, you might be, you have the right answer, you might not be that far from the kingdom of heaven. Would we be able to do that if we knew the person was there trying to trip us up? Trying to create enemies amongst us? How meek in his answers, not revenging himself by cutting replies. You know how when we get done with a conversation, it didn't go so well, where it's a relative or your spouse or one of your children. I should have said that. And you think about it and you have the conversation over again. You shut the door in the bathroom or in some room or you go outside and you keep replaying that same conversation until you get the perfect answer that would destroy them at that moment in time. <laughs> you know how it is. Our Lord didn't have that. You just let it go. There's times where you're just quiet. Remember when they talk about our Lord and He opened His mouth and He spoke. And he raised his eyes and he spoke. I mean, he didn't speak a whole lot. We fall into sin when we speak too much. But our Lord rather was desirous to conciliate his adversaries by humble and meek words. When we read Scripture, you need to read Scripture. When we read Scripture, you can reflect on these things. Start hearing his replies. Start seeing how he answered them. We get, we get foggy in our minds and we start to think that, well, that happened 2,000 years ago. That was a really, really long time ago. That was before they had iPhones and cars and airplanes. We can't understand the way they did things. They're walking around in sandals and it's dusty everywhere. This is, this is kind of what we think about when we think about our Lord, right? But the interactions between humans is, is the same. You don't, you don't have to be on a dusty street to know how you're going to respond to somebody or to be sitting in a synagogue and know how you're going to respond. You don't need that. You don't have to be in the dry air of Palestine to know how you're going to respond to somebody. Our Lord dealt with people that were fallen, like we're fallen, and the people that we have to deal with who are fallen. How compassionate He was towards the oppressed. How he descended to the imperfections, the imperfections of others, like St. Peter. He's very patient with St. Peter. And you could say, well, he was God. He knew what St. Peter was going to do in the end. He was also a man. And it could be very easily, though he was perfect, it could still very easily irritate somebody dealing with all these imperfections. But he picked somebody, just like he does with us, who really isn't capable of a lot of stuff. No matter how great you think you are at something, you're just not capable of a lot of stuff. None of us are. We just we were very, we're very, very limited. Some of you are able to do more things than others, but in some capacity we're going to find how you're very, very limited. Because we just are. It's just the way we are. So when you're dealing with those kind of people, like our Lord's dealing with us, He doesn't get discouraged by our incapacities. He can still use us in our incapacities to do greater things because He can get glory and honor. 
But but in that regard, are we even uh, patient with ourselves as our Lord was patient with St. Peter? You know you're not. You know how you sometimes say when you're alone by yourself and you do something and you're upset that day, how you call yourself stupid and how you, how you get mad at yourself and you, you try to beat yourself up. We do those kind of things. We need to be compassionate with ourselves as our Lord was compassionate with others. We need to be understanding with ourselves the way our Lord was understanding with others. But even when those things happen and you're having one of those days and you find yourself alone in your house or whatever and you're beating yourself up, remember those are temptations, and you're beating yourself up in your, in your own way, we reflect on that imitation of our Lord. How did he deal with others? Because if we're to imitate Christ, we have to be, be toward we have to be towards ourselves as Christ would have been towards us. We have to be towards others as Christ would have been towards them, which means mortifying our reactions, thinking before we speak. And sometimes it feels like death, because especially like, uh, you know, for those people who are closest to you that you're kind of butt heads with sometimes, and they're usually people that are closest to you. You usually get a pattern or habit of how you're interacting with each other, right? I think especially you married people know exactly what I'm talking about. And when you have those patterns of interaction, it's really hard to break them because you just say it. And up, oh, shouldn't have said that, but it was said. You got to learn by, by, by learning how to set a parameter like when, and this is what meditation is for, setting up the barrier, setting up the reflection. How am I going to act? How am I going to work on this virtue today? That's what your meditation is in the morning. That's why you have to pray, especially in the morning. You may not know, but religious pray the greatest bulk of their prayers in the morning. They pray a huge bulk of prayers in the morning. You get up really early and you get all these prayers in. And then the rest of the day, it kind of pitters out a little bit. We pray the rest of the day, but there's it really isn't as much. And then around the end of the day, there's another kind of smaller chunk. It's a, well, a larger chunk, but it's still not as much as like in the morning. We do that because your day, as you all know from your experience, the day just starts picking up, and you know you know if you set out that you're going to you're going to pray later. You know you're just not going to do that. Everything's going to get in the way, and that's probably why you're doing it because you really don't want to do it anyways. And so you set it for later on, and that doesn't happen. It wasn't my fault. Those stuff got in the way. But you know that happens every single day, so you set the prayer schedule in the morning. You're able to get prayer in the morning. And why this is beneficial is because in the morning, you can reflect on that thing you always fail at. You can reflect at those words that you always forget to stop and not say. Said you say. These are virtues. And you make resolutions in your meditation. And you live those resolutions. And you examine your mind, your conscience, midday or at the end of the day. How have I been doing on my resolutions? This is what religious do every single day. And it, it should be what you're doing every single day. It's the only way to grow in imitation of our Lord. It's the only way to start practicing and becoming habituated in virtue. Right? You, you started, you got habituated in the vice of saying that, snapping and saying that thing to your spouse or your children or your coworker or your boss because of a habit of not thinking. Now you have to break that by a habit of thinking. And you do that in your prayer life. How peaceful he was in his whole demeanor. His face. Remember, our external manifestations. You know, and somebody, uh, I don't know, you, somebody cuts you off. So I cut somebody off today. We, we, went, we went to the downtown to a, uh, to visit Blessed Silo. We wanted to pray at the, the tomb of Blessed Silo there in downtown, visit some other churches. And uh, you know how it is if you have your blinker on, they just don't want you to get over anyway, so you just get over, you know. And then I just get this. <laughs> she just these kind of waves, you know. But that's an external manifestation of something that's internal, right? Well, you know, that's one thing in the car. It's another thing when especially for you married people, when you're mad at your spouse and you give them the crumpled up face, right? You give them the crumpled up face because you want them to know how you feel inside. 
or you just go around not saying anything with kind of this grim look on your face. It, you want them to know what's going on inside. That, that is not a demeanor of peace. Our Lord, going to his passion, had a great demeanor of peace. The whole world is greeting her to cry out for his death. And he had a great demeanor of peace. But you know from the garden that he really did suffer. He really did have that agony that we have when we suffer. So it's not like it wasn't a big deal to him. Well, he was God. He knew he was going to rise. No, no, no. He allowed himself to suffer pains that you can't even imagine. And that was a conflict within him. And he allowed that conflict to rage in him as it rages in us. And even more so, he was affected in a grave way, something we would probably die from if we had to face something like that. And he had a peaceful demeanor. So you think about this the next time you have the crumpled up face with your spouse because you're trying to communicate how nasty you feel against them right now and they need to say sorry or whatever else it is. Think about how our Lord had the whole world pitted against him. And not just the people in the world right then and there, but from before and until the end of uh, end of time, pitted against him. And he just had a demeanor of peace. Can you have a demeanor of peace the next time you feel nasty? You know you can, even if it feels like you're dying inside by having that demeanor of peace. Now remember, when we do those things that we feel like we're dying inside, they're meritorious. If someone were to offer you a billion dollars to not have the crumpled up face with your spouse, would you do it? You know you would. You know that for that one thing, oh, I'll get a billion dollars for this, I forgive him. Merit is so much more than a billion dollars because you could get the, you could go pick the billion dollars up on Tuesday and on the way home you're dead. You didn't even get to spend the, the billion dollars, right? But you could lose the crumpled face and live another 50 years and you'll have treasure in heaven for all eternity for simple little acts of love like that. How anxious he was for the salvation of souls for whose sake he deigned to become man, suffer and die. We have to imitate him in this. We have to be anxious for the salvation of souls. We have to put our resources towards it and not just think how nice it would be if somebody else would go evangelize people. That's one of the things, that's why we put that stuff out there in those articles because we know sometimes you can't do that. So you need to use your money and give it to us and we'll have books made and give them to other people trying to seek their salvation. We'll make videos. We'll do other things. You've got to pump your money into the system where the system's functioning so we can continue to evangelize. Because most of the system is broken, nobody wants to pump the money in, so nobody gets evangelized. We have to desire the salvation of everyone. But not some sentimental way by changing the theology. I desire everyone's salvation, therefore no one goes to hell. Well, that just doesn't work. I mean, it's not reality. It's just not reality. We have to, we have to bring the message of Christ to people and show them his love through our actions and through real evangelization. And we have to be willing to suffer and to die. And if you think you can't su if you think you're willing to suffer and die, you need to reflect next time you have the crumpled up face that you can't let go because you're being stubborn, how willing you are to actually suffer and die. To that suffering to forgive when you've been slighted unjustly. But why can't you do it? You know that you have slighted someone else unjustly. You know it. I'm innocent. It doesn't matter if you're innocent. You've done this before to somebody else. Make reparation. Consider his fervor in prayer and how ready to serve others. At nighttime, after a long day, long walk, little food, he needed to eat too, and he needed to sleep. He became a man. He would spend all night in prayer. Now, you don't have to spend all night in prayer, but you need to live a life of prayer. And you need to think about things of prayer as you're heading off to bed. You don't say, I need to relax and put on the TV. 
I need to relax and start doing this with the phone. I watch people's thumbs do this all the time. You need to, you need to actually need to pray. You need to reflect on our Lord. You need to have time alone. There needs to be silence. You should kneel down right before you get in bed. And when you get in bed, you should make the sign of the cross. And as you lay there, you should think of our Lord. You should think of Our Lady. You should think of holy things and pray to your guardian angel, uh, especially that the devil isn't able to put ex impure images and whatever else. It's dangerous at nighttime and it's dangerous being in a bed. We should spend very little time in those things and only to refresh our bodies so that we can get up and do it again, meaning live a life of virtue the next day. So our Lord is our model in all of our actions, right? So when in this imitation, in this reflection, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not bringing up this reflection for us just right now. I'm bringing it up so you can start thinking about through your daily lives how to practice this imitation of Christ, how to make it real, an imitation of Christ as you go through your days by picking out little things, by reflecting on yourself. St. Bonaventure talks about leaving yourself, coming back to yourself, and then going in, in, inside of yourself. So leaving yourself because you need to be able to see yourself from the outside. That's examining yourself. We're like looking down and seeing how am I acting and interacting with people around me? Am I being grumpy all the time? Am I making everybody miserable all the time? And you need to reflect, well, how can I be a man of peace? How can I be a woman of peace? When we speak, we have to we have to try to speak and think, how did our Lord speak? When we're silent, think about the silence of our Lord. And he opened his mouth and he spoke. So, you know, when you're in a gathering and you're just thinking of the next thing to say because there's a lull in the conversation, why do you have to say anything? You know, most likely, what you're getting ready to say is probably going to be rumor. It's going to be hearsay. It's going to be negative. It's going to be on some topic you should be talking about anyways. We should try to speak for edification. It isn't always easy. It's hard to think about. This is why spiritual reading is good, because you can bring those kind of things up. These saints you're reading about, things like that. Our Lord is our model when we walk or when we take food. Are you being moderate with your food? What are you eating when you're in between meals? Do you have to eat when you're in between meals? Remember that taste and touch are the greatest senses that lead us to the greatest sins. We have to mortify food because they lead us to those base actions. Eating like, like, like sheep or cattle, right? Um, it should be an embarrassment in some capacity to us, this love for food. Oh, I can't wait to eat it so-and-so, that restaurant, because I always get that steak and I haven't had it for three months. And we go on and on and on about something ridiculous like food. It's going to go in one end and go right out the other. And you're going to spend a bundle for it, right? You don't have any memory. You just got to think about it again and go repeat the whole base, all completely base. We have a very elevated dignity as humans of baptized Christians. We don't have to think so much about all this food and stuff like that. Tomorrow we'll talk a bit more about that in another way when we talk about perfect joy. So when we're walking with the modesty of Christ, with the, with the thoughtfulness of Christ, with the, you know, keeping, are we curiously looking around? Are, are we letting our mind ramble on into oblivion about things that don't matter? You know how we get in those conversations? When you're walking, you can, you can reflect Christ walking alone. What would he have been doing? His heart would have been beating for God. He would have been praying. Aren't we supposed to do the same thing? When we're alone or in company, the way Christ acted when He was alone, the way Christ acted when He was with His disciples, these are things we need to strive to imitate. Ask Him, how do I act when I'm, when I'm alone? How, how should I act when I'm around other people? This imitation should kindle in us a love for Him. Because think about it, the more you start to strive to know him and think about him and arrive at these uh, at this imitation of him, it should only enkindle in us more and more fervent love for him. Because 
In fact, your relationship starts to grow more because he's constantly before your eyes. There's a beautiful image in Assisi when you're going from the upper basilica of St. Francis Basilica to the, the middle basilica, because there's still, still the lower where, where his tomb, the crypt is. When you go to the lower basilica, you pass kind of into, you go through where the choir is, and you go down this flight of stairs. Then you're in the cloister inside where the, I don't know, it's just called a cloister. And then you, you go back in this other door. When you go in the door that leads you down into the lower basilica, which has beautiful murals all over the place, there is a not so attractive fresco that's just right above the door. It's just real simple. It's like like it's almost like somebody made it with chalk. It, it just isn't this higher quality like you find. And it's absolutely a, a magnificent um, depiction of this imitation. It has our Lord carrying the cross, barefoot, walking forward, and he's looking behind himself. And behind him is St. Francis staring at him with a cross. And he's like stumbling with the cross, kind of excitedly trying to catch up to our Lord. But you can tell that our Lord is waiting for him. He's just kind of like, yeah, come on. Kind of like a father would do with their child when they're, you know, teach him how to do something. That's what our Lord wants to do with us as we learn how to imitate him. And we strive to imitate him. We call these things to mind. We question ourselves on these things so that we can we can realize that love for him in a different way. It disposes us for for his grace and makes our friendship with him very real and personal. Because he really starts to help us and illuminate us. It's what we talked about last night. The more you seek God, the deeper you go into those graces. But he gives that familiarity to those who seek him. That's what we talked about last night with that grace. It's the same thing here. We're disposing ourselves. We're seeking him in a deeper way. We want to live him day in and day out through our interactions in the world. Ever perfecting ourselves in, in his in his great virtues. Therefore, we should constantly be meditating on these ex- aspects of our Lord. This is just even when you're walking around on like you, you, you have to walk somewhere or you're at work or you're. You're at home and you're outside, you know, mowing the lawn or something like that. These, you can have this image of our Lord doing something. That, that means you're constantly meditating on something from our, our Lord's life. Why can't you have that? You have to think how we grew up. Most of us grew up watching movies over and over and over again. Some of you grew up during the time when sitcoms, I don't know if sitcoms are still Probably not. They have all these channels nowadays. But sitcoms before were really popular. I mean, my parents used to watch the MASH or whatever it was. That, and they bought all this, the DVDs afterwards. And they still watch it today. But you get to a point where you know all these one-liners. Right? You know one-liners. You memorize parts of the film. They were telling me about these memes or mims or what are they called? The mims? Mims? Memes? These memes on the computer where you just got this thing that Maybe I'm getting it wrong. I don't know. But you have this thing that replays over and over again. It says something. People memorize those things and just keep regurgitating them to everybody. I don't really know. I think I was in the friary when they started doing this stuff. So I'm just, they tell me about it. I'm not sure. But, but it's the same thing here. What are we memorizing? We have filled our brain with all kinds of lyrical music from the radio. You know, you can put on something and even 20 years later, you can sing all these country songs or you know, light rock music that's sappy and all this other stuff. You know every single word and who wrote it and what year and if it was on the top 40 list. But you don't know hardly any quotes from Scripture. And when you're, in fact, when you're with a group of people, you never quote Scripture. And if you do, you get it wrong. Why, why couldn't, why couldn't we quote Scripture? Make our Lord's life these little mims, memes, memes, memes. The, the meme. I don't know what they are. These replays, these one-liners, and we memorize all these, and we have that that fills our soul, and that comes out of our soul. Not all this other stuff. But we come from a culture that understands this desire, this, this fatigue to know the things of the world, to be astute in the things of the world, to know about what's going on in Hollywood, to have the one-liners from the major movies. You hear that little catchy thing that they say and everybody memorizes it and they start to say it. And everybody knows what you're saying. Everybody laughs, right? But that's all secular nonsense. Why can't we replay the life of our Lord? Why can't we focus our time 
on on these reruns, if you want to call it, of our Lord and sacred scriptures. We listen to the life of our Lord quite often. There's a, a dramatic theatrical uh, representation of Holy Scripture, and they do a good job. We just listen to it uh, often, over and over again. Before actually, before most of them got there, that's all we listened to. We just kept turning the CDs over and over, just sacred scripture constantly playing as we're eating our meals. Magnificent to hear it. And the more you hear it, the more it affects you. The more you think about it, the more it makes sense to you. So if we can do it for Hollywood, we should be able to do it for for heaven. We have been formed in the image and likeness of Satan. That, that's really what's happened through our, our secular formation and all that we've done out in the world. All the memorizing all these, all these songs, the, 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 the memorizing all these actresses and actors and where they came from and who they're married to and all the other things that happen. Most of you probably are distanced from that now, but what have you replaced all that old knowledge that you used to have with? Either nothing or very little. And that's just it. We have to we have to reform ourselves because we've already been formed in this image like of Satan, meaning of the secular environment, of the secular world. We just have to purify it. And that's why to always have a book of the saints that we're reading, spiritual reading every day. When you get done with that book, get another one. When you get done with that book, get another one. Just keep reading about the lives of the saints. It's like a living catechism that we're filtering down into our hearts. That's a beautiful thing. So by doing this, by, by, by trying to form, reform ourselves, by trying to empty out all of that secular jargon that we've intentionally gobbled up and consumed, we can allow ourselves to start being transformed back into Christ by planting good seeds. But we have to be receiving those good seeds by reading good books. If you're going to watch something, they should be good things. We talked about, I think, in Catechism today, if there's a blasphemy, if they take our Lord's name in vain in a TV show, in a program, are you willing to turn it off? A lot of times we're not. Are you, willing, are you willing to leave the room? How about this? Are you willing to stop watching television? What's it doing for you? Are you willing to stop with the fantasy? It's not real. Fantasy's not real. You're taking, you're taking, you're reading books and watching movies and you're filling your, your heart with things that don't exist. You want a reality that God didn't make. Why? When the reality he did make, you still don't understand. You know, when you read the works of, uh, St. Francis de Sales, you ever read the works of St. Francis de Sales? You know how he's always talking about some scientific thing? He was reading secular science. And he saw, because he wanted to know God better, he talks about, you know, I don't know, you'll be reading, he'll start talking about elephants, what elephants do. I mean, how does he know about elephants? And then he'll start talking about bees and what bees do. And then he's talking about sunflowers and how the roots move around. I don't know if any of that stuff's true or not, but he seems to be pretty confident in what he's saying. He definitely read it somewhere and was studying natural sciences. Why? The mystery of God is amazing. What God really created is amazing. And we really don't know any of it. We look up the app to see if the hurricane's going to hit us, yes or no. And we still don't know. <laughs> so transforming ourselves by feeding ourselves, by bringing into ourselves beautiful things that have to do with the faith. Nourishing ourselves. That stuff, what it does is it filters down into our hearts and it comes out later. You know if you watch a nasty movie or something like that, even years later, with let's just say you know, indecent imagery in it or something like that. You know that even years later, that stuff could pop right back in your head. What if you had never seen that and instead you you focus everything on lives of saints? You know, when, when we talk about some of the early, some of the great, uh, uh, some of the great saints, they entered the monastery, the friary, the convent at like 12 years old. But there was one we were reading the other day. She entered at six years old, six years old. These, these guys were saints by the time they were about 15, 16 years old. Right? Why? They just inundated themselves with holy things. They didn't know anything of this world. They only knew and cared about the world of God. 
that God created, that God wanted so they could go to heaven. That's what they wanted. So our meditation, we need to meditate constantly on our Lord. Now I don't mean so much so, it's, I kind of already talked about it, I don't mean like constantly making a meditation. Most of us get confused and say, but what is a meditation? How do I do it? There isn't anything to it. You, you know that if a problem goes wrong at the house, uh, you keep getting bees that come in the house and they're forming a nest somewhere in a corner, whatever. Something's happening. You keep pondering how it's happening, how you can fix it, whatever else. If there's some project that you want to realize, a flower garden, and you don't have one in the front of your house yet, but you really want to get this flower bed in, but you don't really know how you want to do it, you might, you might ponder it and think about it, even for months at a time, trying to realize what that flower bed will look like. And then eventually you go out, you build the flower bed, you put the right flowers in there, and you can see, this is I, I've been preparing for this for months. Even if you're not into flower beds, I think you know what I'm talking about. It might be for building a car, constructing a room, building a barn. Whatever you're trying to do, you've thought about it. You've pondered it for a long time. You've meditated on it. Well, we have Holy Scripture. It tells us all about our Lord's life. We have the works of some of the great saints like Mary of Agreda, who talks all about the life of Our Lady and Our Lord. These things can really help us to give us more imagery. And then you start asking more questions. But what about this? Or How did that work? Or That's meditation. You're meditating, you're thinking about it, you're letting it play over the reruns in your head. You get the reruns in your head. Does that make sense? So always having some reflection. When you find yourself in the car, do you really have to listen to the radio? You know the habit, you get in the car and you, you just, the men are listening to the talk radio and the or sports, and then and the women are listening to, probably not here, you are very virtuous people, but... Sometimes we want to consume ourselves with something else, some other reality. We don't want to think. We want to be, we want to be fed uh, sensorially, right? But could you leave it off and ponder something about our Lord's childhood? Could you ponder what was it like for Our Lady after St. Joseph died, just being alone with Jesus all the time at Nazareth? They were together for 30 years. What did they do during the day? What was it like when they had their meals? You know, did, did they eat between meals? Well, man, they must have. I mean, I bet our lady got hungry sometimes. Or no, she was, she's just a blessed virgin. The blessed virgin doesn't get hungry. You know, so you can sort through it. And start really, it starts to come alive. You start to get to know your friends. These intimate, these intimate relations that we're supposed to have. We can reflect on our actions and our words throughout the day and tweaking it always. That's why we make this examination of conscience. How have I responded to my spouse today? How have I responded to the kids today? You know, when, when I get a headache, when, when I feel hungry, when I'm getting tired, how am I responding to other people around me? How do I extend charity? How am I that person of peace? So the way we can sum this whole thing up is, is to be people that are mad with desire. Desire. It's an interesting way to put it. To be desirous for the things of God. Now, I, I remember uh, reading about the, the conquest of Mexico, which today we're, we're supposed to think was an evil thing, but it was actually a very beautiful thing. When you had uh, Cortez and his men, they go in, they see there's human sacrifice and say, no, no, no. And they, they decide to just take the city, right? Well, some of the troops came in to help them. I think at the end, it's been a while since I've read it, but I remember some of the troops came. They had this battle where they're just, they got swords and they're going, they're battling trying to get up to this, the top of the, the, uh, this temple where they'd done so many human sacrifices. Uh, but they finally kind of take the town. And there's millions of people attacking them and there's only a, a small number of Spaniards. But they uncovered a treasure room and there's just all this gold. Now, they're in the middle of Mexico City. They're on like a causeway. It's a wooden floating bridge or something like that. And it was kind of falling apart. And they're in the middle of this battle. These men see the gold and start loading up on it. They're in the middle of a battle. And I think that their ships were burnt. I don't remember if they could even get home. All they think is, get the gold. 
they loaded, there were certain men that loaded themselves up with gold and started making for it. They're on a causeway. There's just all this water and they've got this like wooden bridge and they're running across a bridge which just loaded down with, who knows, hundreds of pounds of gold. And all they can think, they're just so desirous of this stuff. They're making their way out of there. So they're going to they're going to they're going to be rich, right? They never made it out that people that were there, eyewitnesses, the ones who were fighting and realized, no, no, this we're fighting for our lives right now and not for gold. As they're as they're fleeing out of there, jumping over the causeway, they're jumping over dead Spaniards who had drowned in the water covered in gold. What are you desirous for? Are you desirous for the things of this world? You know how it is. We were desirous to memorize these certain lines so that we can impress our friends at a party. We were desirous so that we could memorize these certain songs so we could sing them with our friends. We were desirous so that we could know the newest fashion or the newest whatever it was. But how desirous are we of God? And this is what we should be desirous of, this imitation of Christ, especially as we see the culture arriving a complete and utter collapse. It isn't by chance that God put us here at a time that's so bad. And we're not here to lick our wounds and whine over the fact that things are getting bad and they're only going to get worse. We're Christians. And hopefully we're in a state of grace. And if we're Christians in a state of grace, we're the only ones that can do anything about the situation that's at hand. The only ones. And that's why we're here. But we can't do anything if we just live like everybody else. Our job is to live like Christ, to be like Christ. And we do that through imitating him day in and day out until it becomes our habit. And in that habit, people get to meet Christ. They get to see Christ. They get to experience for the first time love. You don't know it, but by making yourself this this image of our Lord, because you, you strive and you desire this imitation, well, that, that's going to be the next consequence, isn't it? It's going to be, it's going to be the, uh, the result of your effort is making Christ present to a world that no longer knows him and they don't know him. And what they know of him, they hate. So we have to be in this. It's a way of kind of spurring us forward We have to be like those men who are so desirous of gold, they risk life and limb to load themselves up with gold because they wanted a momentary uh, riches. We have to be so desirous for heaven and the salvation of souls that we're willing to risk everything, even our life, for the love of God. As they risk for gold, we risk for God. It's an easy thing to sort out because life is short. So a couple of reflections that we can we can reflect on in our own lives. You know, what's our mode of dress? How do we how do we how do we present ourselves to the world around us? Especially for the women. It's very important that our culture has lost the feminine. It doesn't have the beauty of the feminine anymore. Feminism has robbed the world from beauty because it's made women want to be equal to men. And what being equal to men in dignity, they are equal to men. But what the world's telling them, they have to be equal in dress. They have to be equal in work. They have to be equal in respect. They have to be equal in all these different things. So they strive for things that men are supposed to be doing. And men start to shy away from what they're supposed to be doing. One thing is in dress. You don't see women dressing like women anymore. And the world lacks beauty because of it. Because the feminine. To see women with their bright colors on and their beautiful skirts on. Dressing in a way that is feminine. We, we lack that today. For men, having that dignity, I think most of you probably don't have this problem, but when you, when you show up to Mass, uh, and even the way we present ourselves in the culture, having that upright dignity. You know what it's like when you meet these older, refined gentlemen who, you know, they've even got the, like, handkerchief in there, and you're thinking, well, that's, that's, that's very beautiful, you know? It's interesting that they, they still dress that way. You know, they got the hat and everything. Yeah, they might have the tie, the... You know, they have all the, 
It's just beautiful. Uh, but we don't do it because it's okay. We've become casual. We've become casual. On the vanity of speech or the excess of our speech, this gets us in so much trouble, especially in parish life. You get people just talking all the time, and it really does just start to rip communities apart. The mortification of the palate, caring what we eat, being so concerned about what foods we get, about you know what we eat next, about where we go. What are you hungry for? Who cares? It's food. You're going to eat it. You're going to eat it again later. It's just what happens. So flattery or criticism, do you flatter people over overly a little bit too much? Remember, our Lord didn't go around flattering people. Or are you overly critical? Our Lord didn't go around criticizing people. You know, the truth is the truth, and sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a charity to share it with somebody. You, you know, and, and it takes courage also to do that, but with charity. The use of sensorial devices, we're talking about the phone here. Those stinking iPhones. I've had people get mad at me and say that I'm, uh, what is it called, an erudite? Erudism. Eruditism. Ludite. A ludite. I'm a ludite. Which I think means that you don't, what is it? Yeah. Which is ridiculous because we use technology. What it is, is those, those phones are so much made to addict you to their apps, right? We get so used to them that actually when we get tired, we find ourselves just wanting to relax, as we say, and just look at things. And this becomes a problem for us because we have very little time and each day is very important because you don't know how many God's given you. Those days that you've been given aren't just to be lived out until you die. They're to be lived out by perfecting yourself ever more so that you arrive at the perfection that God intended for you. A phone is not helping you do that. In fact, it's making it so that you don't even know where the grocery store is anymore. Probably not you all because you it's kind of a small town. Grocery store is just down that way, right? So, But those phones can really get in our way because they are made in a way that engages you and keeps you engaged. It's not to be against the phone. They still make phones that don't do that. You can have a phone. You can still text with those things, and it takes a long time. The flip ones, right? But we need to, we need to check on the kind of devices we're using and how they are affecting our lives, how they are controlling our lives. Because you have the dignity of a baptized Christian and the dignity and the duty of becoming a saint and anything that's getting in your way of that needs to be smashed and separated from you immediately. And then complaining internally or externally. You know how it is. Sometimes you may not complain to anybody, but as soon as you shut the door, as soon as you're home alone, you start murmuring under your breath. Almost all of us do it. We have to really put that in check and remember, how, how did our Lord deal with it? When he, when he dealt with all the disciples, did he say anything under his breath? No, because what, what is saying something under your breath? Does it really alleviate any stress, any pain that you have? Job says it doesn't. It just makes you feel worse. And we all know that's the case after years of life. So in the end, the world needs Christ. It's ripped Christ from every way. Even, even in some of our churches, very little has to do with Christ. We see that. We see it in some of our liturgies. It just has to do with us. Man has become completely human-centered. How will we get Christ at the center of things again unless we ourselves do our duty and be Christ to the world? That is what your confirmation grace is for. And so this is what our reflection is for. How do we enter into our confirmation grace? You do it by striving and desiring that life of Christ so that you can live Christ in your personal life at home and when you go out um, into society day in and day out. But as, as the culture falls apart, it seems to me that's what's needed. We're, we're being called to a very special task right now and that task is to bring Christ to the world. Any questions? Nothing.
Yeah. Think about it, man. Just don't you explain that and let the person go just out of yourself and then let others do the second example. Let me let me see if I'm getting this correct. So what was it? He goes he goes out of yourself, um, returns to yourself, and then he goes into himself. Is that what it was? Do you remember? Yeah, transcends itself. Okay, so so Saint Bonaventure. It's been a while since I looked over it. I actually need to meditate on it more. But it's a beautiful. He 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 has these three things. It comes up over and over again in his spirituality. You need to leave yourself, return to yourself, and then transcend yourself or overcome yourself. Right. So what what it means is we need to leave ourselves so that we can see who we are. It, it gives us the ability to. Think about who we are, how we interact with people around us, how I'm acting. You know how when you get into a funk, you, you, you just, you're just this dark cloud that hates everything. This is what we do when we get in the dark clouds, right? Well, if we could transcend and like see ourselves, we would be embarrassed by the ugly, crinkled up face that we have all the time. If we can leave ourselves in these instances and really in any instance. And then we can see that, we can ponder that, we can return to ourselves, so that we can, we, can, uh, we can now change that thing and then we can transcend ourselves, leading ourselves ever more above our, our, our human nature because we are called to the divine. And so we're called to the supernatural nature. And that's what we talked about yesterday with grace and how it, it doesn't just come to us and give us certain gifts. It permeates our whole being with the substance of God as the as the, the Holy Ghost penetrates our soul when he infuses the grace, which is only an accident, but the Holy Ghost comes in his substance. So in that, they want to lead us to the divine. We have to keep overcoming our natural inclinations, which are usually base. That's what leads us to be kind of nasty and to be grumpy and to be whatever else. Because if we were to leave ourselves, we would realize there's nothing here to be nasty about. There's nothing here to be grumpy about. But we don't, we don't think that because we allow our, our nature, that is our, our body, to dictate to us, no, you're tired. You have a right to be nasty right now. No, no, you're, you, you didn't get enough sleep last night. Or no, 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 you didn't, uh, you, you didn't get the, 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 you didn't get the dessert that everybody else got. Somebody dropped yours on the floor and you're still bitter about it, right? So, you, you have these things, but you know if you were able to leave yourself, that is the natural, the, all your natural inclinations that are dictating how you act right now, if you, could, if you could go outside of yourself and look down at that natural beast that's acting right now, then you could return to yourself and change it and overcome it. And this is what we have to strive to do. Because we're, we have that ability with having the use of reason. We're able to see that because I'm tired, that doesn't have to dictate how I act. Because I'm upset, it doesn't have to dictate how I act. We're above those things, and we can be above those things. For example, like our Lord, when He, when he saw Lazarus, uh, he, he wept. Our Lord was above that. He didn't have to weep. But he had, he, had, he had those real emotions, and He allowed Himself to weep so He could, he could, he could, have our, he could experience our emotions with us, right? I don't know if that's probably the best example. Uh, let me give a different example. We suffer the great pain at a friendship. You know how it is nowadays. You, you, you just lose a friendship just like that. People will just cut off all ties with you just like that. Hurts. It, 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 it very much hurts. And you can feel deep pain from that, right? And when you go to pray, you might feel all that deep pain but you know from the supernatural being in you, well, these things don't matter. I mean, what am I supposed to do about it? There's no contradiction between pain and joy in the spiritual life. Pain in the, in the natural that makes me weep and joy in the supernatural that makes me know that these things don't, don't really affect me. I, I, haven't done, uh, I haven't done anything that's led to this. It's just a consequence of fallen human nature on someone else's part. You weep from the pain that you have, but you're able to overcome that because you can see that it has nothing really to do with anything at all. Does that make sense? I'm probably not describing it all that well. 
Because often in the spiritual life, things go wrong in life. And they go wrong often. Uh, But as they go wrong, the, the fact that God's providence continues to hold you here in existence and God's providing for everything that you need, though you feel being like you're being ripped in half inside, and that makes you want to weep from the sorrow, like of a lost, a loved one, or whatever else. When you kneel down before our Lord, you can still have joy because those things don't really have control over you. You're doing God's will. I do your will. What do you want of me? I offer this to you. And you weep for it. There's nothing wrong with weeping for something, but still knowing that thing doesn't dominate me. This is the thing about people, they say that they're wounded. You hear it all the time. It's because psychology tells us we're wounded. I went to a psychologist because I had to do it for the the diocese, right? And they, they just kept saying, that must have really hurt. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but you just get over it, right? And they didn't, don't take that kind of... Uh, they, they, they think that a wound is something that has to really... It determines how we're going to respond to stimulus. It determines how we are now. We have to come, we have to overcome these, we need help to overcome these great hurts. No, you don't. We get hurt and we realize my nature gets hurt, but I realize in the supernatural, it doesn't affect me. We are very resilient because God has created us for heaven, not for earth. And at earth, people are fallen and they treat each other like dirt. Even if one of your children are not going to let you see your grandchildren ever again. You can weep because that hurts. But you can be a joy because that has nothing to do with you. You, you. you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing before God. Right? And we have the joy of knowing we're serving God. And He's allowing this to happen to me because He's good. And He'll make good of this. Does that make sense? There isn't a contradiction between feeling sorrow and being joyful. Christ was always in perfect joy because he had the beatific vision. But he wept when he saw his friend in the tomb. He he felt, uh, I don't know if it was fear, but he felt all the, the agony from the passion. But he still had the beatific vision. You couldn't separate him from heaven. Right? There's no there's no contradiction. No, no. There's there, there's no one feeling there because you're com- you're completely How so? You're not. The thing is that that you just you just have to. You just, well, you just communicate in some way, but you don't have to play a superficial game with people because they're on a base level. Yeah. It's not. It's not our. It's not our job to do. In the end, they'll understand when they get older that they're being childish. They're still very immature. <clears throat> but because somebody's immature, it doesn't mean you have to act immaturely so they understand. You don't do that with children, do you? Actually, we see it. We see it in all kinds of youth ministry today. We try to lower ourselves to the kids, and in the end, what happens? Everybody just starts acting like a goofball, and nobody gets any more mature. No, no. The people today, they need to be able to see mature adults. But adults have given up their rights to a lot of that stuff, because adults act like goofballs. And so younger people, don't, they don't believe they can trust adults for anything. So what they need is they need to see reverent, uh, distinguished behavior coming from adults. And we don't get upset about things. It's like, why am I going to be upset about that? It's like, you, you 
are, you know, you'd have to make decisions, whatever. Eventually they, they may come and ask you. But I'll tell you what, even if people are going to, your own children, are never going to talk to you again, what are you worried about? And, and, yeah, and, and so, the, so the thing is, the thing is, is that our Lord said, unless you hate your mother and your father and your, and your own life, and that's what it is. We don't, you know, you've, you've done your job towards your children. If they want to hate you and not let you see their children and everything else, these are horrible crosses. But unless you pick up your cross and you follow me, you can't be my disciple. You know, so we, th- there's pain with that, but there's joy in knowing that I, I serve the Lord. And the grace that comes from it, you have no idea what it's going to do for your children. You may never see it, but there will be an abundance of grace. And remember, the world lacks grace right now because people aren't willing to let, to let the natural go. They're just not willing to do it. So you may not be able to, because if somebody is operating on the base, they're not going to fully understand you on a higher level, but they'll see the dignity of it. So I don't think they'll see it as cold because they know you're not cold. They have to. They have to know you're not a cold individual, right? I mean, I, does that make sense? Well, maybe for you, Leanne, maybe. Anybody else? No? Okay. We'll just say a quick prayer.